Hello and welcome to today's event, IPC in Primary Care Settings. I'm your host, Dahlia Killsback. I am an IPC fellow at Nakui. I am a member of the Northern Cheyenne Nation and also a descendant of the Sonnet Band of Wampanoag. Today's event is the final event in our Nakui Project First Line Community of Learning series titled Infection Prevention and Control, IPC, for Distinctive Urban Indian Care Settings. Today's session will be recorded for educational purposes and um, quality improvement purposes. We ask that you please turn on your video if you can, mute yourself when you are not speaking and introduce yourself in the chat by pro providing your name, organization and any tribal affiliations. For today's session after this overview, we will move into knowledge sharing by Karen Kwok and a UIO spotlight by Debbie Dahl with the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic. After that, we will have an open floor discussion before we close today's event. Objectives for today's training include to improve UIO workers' knowledge and understanding of key IPC concepts and actions within primary care settings, to improve UIO workers' awareness of how IPC can be easily integrated into their everyday work, and to create space for peer-to-peer -peer learning and sharing on IPC between UIOs. To, pro to provide some background, the National Council of Urban Indian Health, also known as NICUI, is the national nonprofit organization devoted to the support and development of quality, accessible, and culturally competent health and public health services for American Indians and Alaska Natives, AI and ANs, living in urban India urban areas. Nikuri is the only national representative of the 41 Title V urban Indian organizations or UIOs under the Indian Health Service, IHS, and the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act. Nikui strives to improve the health of over 70% of the AIAN population that lives in urban areas, supported by quality healthcare centers. Before we begin today's event, we want to acknowledge that Nikui's office in Washington, D.C. lies on the ancestral land of the Nakat Tonk people, later known as the Anacostan people, ancestors of today's Piscataway people. DC is also home to a diverse Native community of tribal citizens who continue to act as stewards of this land. Nikui is com committed to honoring and supporting Indigenous communities in all that they do. At this moment, we ask you to take a brief pause to acknowledge the Indigenous land you are joining us from. We want to acknowledge that Nakui is proud to partner with Project First Line as supported through our cooperative agreement. The CDC is an agency within the Department of Health and Human Services, and the contents of this program do not necessarily represent the policies of CDC or HHS and should not be considered an endorsement by the federal government. Project First Line is a national collaborative led by the CDC to provide infection control training and education to frontline workers. And Nakui is one of more than 75 partners across the country who are working to provide innovative and accessible infection control education to help prevent infectious disease deaths in healthcare. Now for the knowledge sharing portion of the presentation, we are going to hear from Karen Kwok. Karen is a nationally certi certified family nurse practitioner with over 20 years of experience working in health equity, including coordinating care for UIO patients in San Francisco. Karen works as a contractor with Nikui's Project First Line. Her public service has been recognized by the American Nurses Credentialing Center, Bill and Melinda Gates Institute, President Obama, and more. Karen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dahlia. For the next slide, that's the correct slide, sorry. Uh, for those who may not be familiar, there are 41 urban Indian organizations, also known as UIOs, authorized under Title V of the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. The Indian Health Services uses four key categories to classify UIOs, full ambulatory, limited ambulatory, outreach and referral, and outpatient and residential alcohol and substance abuse treatment. We are focusing primarily on 
um, primary care settings today, um, but we wanted to also remind everyone that infection prevention and control, also known as IPC, can happen in any of these UIO settings. Next slide. Perfect. Uh, primary care includes safe, high quality ambulatory services, especially for patients with chronic illnesses. Oftentimes as the initial point of contact, the primary care team coordinates complex information management and care across multiple settings, such as long COVID, requiring cardiology and pulmonary specialty follow-up. For tertiary care, primary care coordinates the safe transfer, most commonly via the emergency room for patients needing overnight observation and inpatient management. Next slide, please. With the purpose of establishing care and routine follow-up, the list here entails a few of the many services provided in the ambulatory care setting. Meeting the patient's needs comprehensively requires everyone on the team, and this includes several different types of providers, such as the physician and family nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and nurse midwives, case management, like pharmacists, nurses, and medical assistants, rehabilitation, such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, behavioral health, social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, community health workers, and support professionals like um, health coaches, informal caregivers, and then our resource providers and partners like WIC, Food Pantry, and Medical Transport. Next slide, please. Among the 41 UIOs, there are some preventative primary care services that are provided. These services center on health promotion, with 85% of the UIOs offering immunizations, 73% offering annual checkups, and 73% offering chronic disease prevention. And next slide, please. Additional UIO services reflect the important roles that youth, elders, and parents have in the community. Traditional culture, a productive factor, is used with UIOs to promote wellness with traditional healing as well as offering youth, elder, and parenting support programs. We discuss IPC practices and traditional healing in this community of learning event on IPC and urban behavioral health settings, which you can also watch on YouTube. In the wellness visit, there are several components. Specifically, health promotion activities that are IPC related include screening and vaccinations according to age, job, and or place of residence. For example, patients who live in a nursing home should receive Pneumovax as one of the recommended vaccinations. Preventative services may also include risk assessment with a baseline hepatitis C and HIV test. For individuals 18 to 79 years of age, the United States Preventative Services Task Force recommends this screening. Knowing this status is important in the event of a healthcare work needle stick injury so that you would know what your immunity status is for patients that may have hepatitis C or HIV. Individuals with jobs that involve these potential exposures would be assessed for their status with hepatitis B, measles, mumps, rubella, through antibody titers that can help guide what is the action needed depending on exposures. If there is no immunity to hepatitis B or measles, mumps, rubella, a patient with healthcare work should consider immunization to prevent infection. For tuberculosis, a PPD skin test or a chest x-ray is a common prerequisite for employment. Next slide. Infections ranging from chickenpox, diphtheria, influenza, measles, tuberculosis, leptospirosis, and pertussis have produced illness and extensive um, deaths within the AIAN communities. History does not need to repeat itself. UIO staff and patients can receive vaccines available for diphtheria, measles, pertussis, and the flu. 
where vaccines work by imitating an infection, it is safer to get vaccinated than to get the actual sickness. Vaccines can strengthen the body's natural defenses over several doses to achieve the maximal immunity possible. Next slide, please. According to primary care's risk assessment by Asian exposures, those exposures being from work or residence, recommended vaccines should be received on schedule. Vaccination programs include health promotion for patients, as well as staff safety with vaccine administration procedures and needle stick injuries to be considered. For needle stick prevention, practice hand hygiene, the donning of gloves and, and no recapping. A great resource for education on individual immunizations can be obtained on the CDC training website. And you can see this in the chat box. Next slide, please. Vaccines are but only one line of defense to protect the body's reservoirs against invasion through these pathways. But while we are focusing on primary care scenarios here, it's not exclusive just to any particular setting. We have to be thinking about this across all practice settings in all UIO services that are rendered. Next slide, please. With the CDC's recommendation for occupational health services, specifically for pregnancy, we should evaluate and manage new health conditions as they arise for IPC staff safety. Individuals who are pregnant should make sure that their vaccines are up to date. Workers who are pregnant should also continue to use standard precautions as well as transmission-based precautions. Each primary care clinic should have or get the ability to provide occupational health services to all their employees. And this may also be through a partner third party agency that provides these services for the UIO if they don't have that on site. Besides getting vaccinated, avoid people who have infection along with good hand hygiene and PPE use. Staff who are pregnant are susceptible to illness and further complications like with flu, measles, or varicella. So they should minimize contact and not enter the room of someone who is suspected to have any of these conditions. Next slide, please. Let's start with our first scenario. A UIO partner agency often works together with your center for prenatal care. Once per week at a gathering circle, soon to be in new mothers make cradle boards and support one another. On Friday, you receive a call from your local health department um, department and partner agency regarding an outbreak. There's a new illness that begins as fever and cough with rash, but it can rapidly progress to shortness of breath and possible miscarriage. Those especially vulnerable are women late in their pregnancy. The UIO partner agency is requesting assistance with their prenatal clients, the class where the exposure had occurred. You learn one participate in the Monday prenatal class had mild symptoms of sniffles, but thought it was just allergies until the rash appeared yesterday. The rash appears on the face at the hairline and then spreads downward to the face, torso, arms, and legs. She sat less than six feet amongst her friends for more than two hours. No one had masks on since the relaxation of the COVID mandate, although a few participants did remember to use alcohol-based and sanitizer. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to point out again that um, for paid as well as unpaid or volunteer healthcare professionals, that uh, we should always make sure that their vaccination status is up to date. Measles is transmitted by airborne droplet or contact exposure for as short as five minutes of face-to-face -face contact up to two hours in a closed room. The local public health department with CDC investigates a case of a reportable disease, disease outbreak or epidemic. This investigation includes interviews with exposed patients with and without symptoms as well as facility staff. 
there'll be tracking of reported cases as well as they're testing for their measles, mumps, rubella status. There'll be recommendations for quarantine, isolation, and treatment. And then measures will be taken to identify those women likely to be susceptible to measles, including their assessment of age, vaccination history, antibody testing, as well as pregnancy status. Next slide, please. This ICAR tool is a resource that is available for institutions to self-assess various infection prevention and control topics like hand hygiene, environmental services, point of care blood testing, and wound care. These self-assessments don't take the place of assessments from accrediting bodies, but they are definitely a useful tool to identify potential gaps in infection prevention control policies, procedures, and protocols. We'll be using this same tool to further describe how it can be applied in this scenario, as well as the following scenarios. Next slide. To minimize infection risk from pathways of breathing in and touch, masks, hand hygiene, PPE, an airborne infection, an isolation room, um, disinfecting of services. These are all safeguards with a measles exposure. The use of post-exposure vaccination and use of immunoglobin, depending on the scenario and the patient's circumstance, would be used to help prevent the measles occurrence in exposed susceptible persons. A furlough of five to 21 days after exposure, as well as until four days after the rash, is implemented here regardless of their vaccination or immunoglobulin G. If they receive immunoglobulin G, furlough for 20 days is required in that circumstance. Next slide, please. Providers of pediatric care in this next scenario is in a unique position not only to attenuate to diminish disease incidents during childhood, but also to improve the health status of the special population as a whole. Primary care includes review of wellness and immunization schedule appropriate for age. A health history and health risk assessment should tailor the care for individuals with special needs such as birth defects or developmental disabilities. Infection risk and severity of complications can occur with individuals that have obesity, pulmonary disease, or neuromuscular conditions, for example. Next slide, please. Uh, we'll now go into our second scenario. With your tribal early childhood home visiting program, the social worker visits young parents with family support services. Because a cousin's baby had the same symptoms in daycare, the mother is worried about her five-month-old infant's low-grade fever and loose stool for the past day. The infant is up to date with primary care wellness and immunization schedules for their age. The infant is alert, playful, and active with the same number of wet diapers. The parents wonder if the whole family is going to come down with diarrhea. And this scenario was based on the family spirit model, which was used in Wind River, which is the only evidence-based home visiting model designed specifically for Native Americans. Next slide, please. Rotavirus infection is spread by fecal oral contact and hygiene, especially with handling soiled diapers and ensuring diaper change tables using environmental reservoir of dry surfaces and body reservoir gut should be cleaned and disinfected. To minimize germs spread through these pathways, hand hygiene and environmental cleaning and disinfection are IPC actions to protect the gut from rotavirus infection. Your UIO social work colleagues should use PPE gloves and hand hygiene if coming into contact with soiled diapers. Parents can keep all surfaces, especially diaper changing areas, clean and disinfected, ensuring the infant gets all doses in the rotavirus vaccine series is also protection against the infection. 
Two rotavirus vaccines are currently licensed for infants in the United States. Rotatech is given in three doses at two, four, and six months of age. Rotarix is given in two doses at age two and four months. Most children, about nine out of 10, who get the vaccine will be protected from severe rotavirus disease. About seven out of 10 children will be protected from rotavirus of any severity level. Tribal early childhood home visiting programs that include public health nurses can help support parents in the program learn about healthy child development, life skills, and AIAN traditions around parenting and for support of vaccines. Primary care should be glad to know that infants here in this scenario already had their four-month-old vaccine, so are likely protected against any severity, but particularly severe consequences of the rotavirus infection if they had been exposed. And this was having been a recipient of the second dose of the rotavirus vaccine per schedule. And other good signs that the infant is stable and doing okay is that they are alert with sufficient hydration based on the same number of wet diapers. And this um, suggests that they are stable. Um, next slide, please. Now, uh, for youth, obesity is prevalent in our AIAN communities, and it's among the highest um, for all races and ethnicities, and it is significantly um, associated with abnormally high blood glucose levels, as well as higher abdominal adiposity. Diabetes and cardiovascular diseases are common conditions in Indian country and are also risk factors for severity and mortality with infections overall. So consider testing for prediabetes and type 2 diabetes in AIN children and adolescents when you find that there is overweight or obesity as recommended by the American Diabetes Association. Screening for hepatitis C virus, as we had previously discussed, should also occur at least between the ages of 18 and 79 years of age per the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force and Centers for Disease Control. Schools are our partners with promoting uh, children and adolescent health, and they are our daily contact that directly with up to 15.4 million students attending grades 9 to 12 in 2020, that schools were those same vital partners in connecting teens to the health services that they need for youth development and preser preservation of culturally based efforts. And next slide, we'll come to our third scenario. At a school-based health center with a youth program, the community health worker is holding a presentation on HCV, hepatitis C, and prevention. After the presentation, the youth approaches the speaker to review concerns about what they just learned about hepatitis C transmission. Because their pediatrician had shared worries about future diabetes given their current weight and family history, they had been borrowing their parents' glucometer to check for possible diabetes. This family member has both hepatitis C and HIV. The youth is very anxious that they might have contracted hepatitis C or HIV with sharing the glucometer device. Next slide, please. To avoid spread of hepatitis C, HIV, as well as hepatitis B, do not use finger stick devices between um, different individuals, and it's also called lancing devices. Use a blood, blood glucometer for more than one person without cleaning and disinfecting can be a risk for transmitting hepatitis C and HIV and hepatitis B. Make sure that you change your gloves and perform hand hygiene between finger stick procedures and make sure that insulin pens are only for one individual to um, use to avoid any infection transmission. Next slide, please. 
in working with youth um, here in this example, um, we should practice standard precautions and make sure that we prevent our pathways from the infection transmission through breaking down of the body's barriers, and that we also are um, careful with the reservoirs for infection, in this case, blood and devices. And we practice um, the IBC measures of injection safety. In our next example for um, elders, and elder care. Health promotion for senior care requires engagement with durable medical equipment, um, tox box, glasses, and assistive um, devices to make sure that um, our seniors are active and engaged and aware when we are promoting health. This is especially important for safe care with polypharmacy and increased infection risk with malnutrition and cognitive deficits. Hand hygiene can help you protect against minor wound infections becoming more serious problems because of their delicate skin and diminished immune response. Clean hands also stops from passing on the flu whereby secondary pneumonia complications can lead up to more than 60% of seniors over age 65 requiring hospitalization for flu complications secondarily. This final scenario will be um, working with elders. After receiving a family's phone call, the public nurse referred the family to be seen urgently by their UIO primary care instead. The homebound grandmother has well-controlled diabetes, but her post-operative wound care has been a challenge. Her family frequently rotates pillows under her legs and sides of her body to keep her comfortable and to avoid bed sores as she recruit, recuperates from her hip surgery that she had had because she fell and sustained a fracture. With the family's daily routine for bathroom hygiene, however, they noted that the skin area had broken down and was seeming to get worse with warmth, redness, a new foul odor, and pus discharge. When examined in clinic, the wound is too serious to be managed adequately or appropriately at the UIO center. You suspect it's a multi-drug resistant skin infection of the surgical site with concerns about recovery given her age, diabetes, and recent surgery. With transferring the patient um, to the UIO partner hospital for tertiary care management, what information needs to be shared with the hospital? Next slide, please. Because patients with diabetes are at higher risk for infection and their diminished immune response can occur with advanced age and hygiene, PPE and environmental cleaning, these three can be incredibly helpful IPC actions to protect against minor wound infections from becoming more serious problems, especially after a surgery. One thing we like to highlight is considering the National Healthcare Safety Network, SSI criteria. If you or your team are not familiar with um, this group, we'll provide additional information here in the chat box that can be reviewed later. And so a couple of the different steps from um, this criteria list is protect patients and staff and prevent germ spread from the pathways of breaking down the body's defenses and touch where hip replacement qualifies as a deep incisional primary SSI per the criteria of one, occurring within 30 to 90 days of procedure, two, involving deep soft tissues of the incision, for example, the fascia or the muscle layers, and three, it could also include any of these elements such as pus purulent drainage, from the deep incision site, a deep incision that is deliberately open, aspirated, or spontaneously breaks open, dehesces, and the patient having at least one of the following symptoms of fever, localized pain or tenderness, or an abscess. 
Next slide, please. So here, um, in order to protect our seniors with IPC actions, we should consider the pathways of touch breaking down the body's defenses when we are practicing standard and contact precautions, that we are using hand hygiene, PPE, environmental cleaning, device reprocessing, and disinfection techniques to ensure that we don't transmit infection or are engaged in germ spread for our um, elders. Next slide, please. Primary care is the first point of contact with more advanced and emergent care that is needed. Referrals are made to secondary specialists and tertiary inpatient care. And surveillance and disease reporting would include alerts for presentation of mystery patients when we are coordinating care to this level. In our primary care health risk assessment, medical history with a predisposition for infection risk, such as immunocompromise or not yet having received immunization against an illness should be communicated when we transfer care. We should also govern antibiotic stewardship with the concern of increasing antimicrobial resistance. And back to the same scenario, with the grandmother's surgical site infection, the hospital partner agency would need to know about the reason for the referral, the patient risk assessment with infection risk due to advanced age, diabetes, and being postoperative, as well as how to keep other patients and staff safe from germ spread due to touch pathways. Next slide, please. With intrafacility transfers, this is one example of a form that can be used. However, this can also be done as an oral report via phone call to the hospital partner. What is most important is that you share the pertinent information so that infection prevention is observed, like letting the paramedics know to wear a mask if they're transporting a patient with a cough, such as tuberculosis, for example. Next slide, please. Um, here are IPC recommendations for proper storage and positioning of supplies. Shipping containers, especially those made of a corrugated material, serve as generators and, and reservoirs for dust. Corrugated um, cardboard boxes are susceptible to moisture, water, vermin, and bacteria during warehouse or storeroom storage, as well as transportation environments. Boxes and containers have been exposed to unknown and potentially high microbial contamination should always be in the back of your mind as a possible alert as well. When organizations are making a determination as to whether these boxes and containers are appropriate to be located in a certain area, consider the potential adverse impact of dust, moisture, bacteria, or other contaminants in the area. We should also think about the applications of positive pressure, controlled temperatures under 75 degrees Fahrenheit, humidity within the range of 30 to 60% in work areas, and less than 70% in sterile storage. This is just to illustrate that all team members are involved in each room, in each setting within a UIO. And lastly, how this all comes together from the IPC actions that we can take with the various groups of people that we see in primary care and health promotion for these groups. Things to include within your protocol for IPC include process indicators, such as standard precautions and the um, Department of Public Health report, um, thinking about your IPC program and infrastructure, training competency for personnel safety, and some topics that you can dive in deeper. And certainly our IPC team here at NAKUI can provide support regarding those topics of surveillance, outbreak control, isolation, hand hygiene, antibiotic resistance, as well as employee health. Next slide, please. Um, so again, we applied an IPC lens to primary care regarding health history, 
the wellness schedule, vaccine schedule, risk assessment for maternity, pediatrics, youth, and seniors, and whether it's routine follow-up in primary care or an acute issue requiring urgent care attention. The many services provided in an ambulatory care setting depend on the entire team to keep patients and staff safe from infection. Next slide, please. Uh, this brings us to the end of knowledge sharing. We hope that you enjoyed listening and following along with these scenarios and that they had helped you pause and reflect on how everyday activities in your life also can use these tools as well as vice versa. As a reminder, if your UILO would like to uh, request technical assistance or provide us with scenarios for occurrences that came up for you, please make sure you fill out the form on the new Kui website or email us directly. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you for leading our knowledge sharing, Karen. Now we, we will move on to our UIO spotlight and have the pleasure of hearing from Debbie Dahl from the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic. The Oklahoma City Indian Clinic, or OKCIC, is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation that strives to increase access to quality healthcare and wellness services and produce positive healthcare outcomes for urban American Indians living in central Oklahoma. Our presenter today from OKCIC is Debbie Dahl. Debbie graduated from the University of Oklahoma with a degree in biology. After teaching for many years, she completed nursing school at Oklahoma City University. She received her master's in nursing from Oklahoma Baptist University. Debbie works for the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic as infection prevention and control manager. She serves as treasurer for the OKLA APIC chapter, is a member of OSAP and is board certified in infection prevention and control. Her hobbies include clog dancing, traveling, and working with her many cactus plants. Debbie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dahlia. All right, I'm going to just pretty much bounce off of some of the things that Karen said also here too. But I wanted to start off by telling you, I've been at IP for 13 years. In those 13 years, I've worked at many different types of hospitals. Uh, well, three different hospitals. Uh, one was a surgical hospital. One was a behavioral health hospital. Um, then also now at the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic. All of those have been um, certified by different places. We have DNV from one place. We have Joint Commission from another one. And then the Indian Clinic is certified by the AAAHC. So with that being said, everybody has their own standards, of course, that they look for. But there's one thing that we all have in common is that they all of these places all have germs. So we have to be on top of our game in making for sure that we're not only keeping our, our patients safe, our employees safe, but also our facilities safe. So the first thing when I do when I come in is I like to develop my clean team and I call them EVS staff. You might call them housekeeping staff. You might call them maintenance or different areas. I like to call them um, EVS staff. So that's what I'm going to call them in this in this area in, in this presentation. So my objectives, of course, are to recognize how valuable your environmental services staff um, are. They are my frontline people. And we're also going to look at some challenges that I have also seen with um, my cleaning team. So as we know, germs are everywhere. But I always know that my EVS workers, they're my key players. They are the main people that I have on my infection control team because they are out there in all of the rooms every day, emptying the garbage every day, touching the linens and doing all the things that where they are exposed to all the germs. So what I like to do, first of all, is I always like to get to know my EVS workers. I also want to make for sure that they know me. So uh, when I first come in, I always like to have an orientation with them 
And the main thing is, is you want them to feel comfortable that they can come to you and they can say, hey, I see this going on or I see people putting uh, biohazard things into the trash. Those things are really important because I mean, sure, they, they look in the trash sometimes. So the main thing is, is get to know your EVS workers. And, um, you know, sometimes they're my employees. Sometimes they actually work for us. I've also worked at hospitals where the, envir uh, the EVS workers, they're not my employees. They work for a third party. So I go to them and I like, who trains your staff? And they go, hmm, no one. I said, I'm going to train them because it's really important that as the infection preventionists, we are training our environmental services staff. So I like to give them a lot of kudos. I like to give them out awards. I'll make up little certificates that says that they do good and they are always so appreciative. And I always tell them, I wish I could give you a, a million dollars for all you have done through COVID and keeping our facility safe. We want to keep our doors open. We don't want to have to close our doors because of an outbreak or because of, of, of an infection. So I always like to tell them how important that they are and, uh, you know, give them little things too. It always goes a long ways. So um, I, we, I meet with my EVS staff twice a year. Um, you know, usually with competence, with competencies, you say once a year is good. No, it's not. Because EVS staff, they have a lot of turnaround, okay? I mean, you know, they not they change jobs a lot. So um, when I meet with them, I just met with them in, in August. And so I make, used to meet with them in August and then again in February, bring food because they love that, of course. And they all come, all of the environmental services um, staff, they all come. They like to learn things and they're really interested in making this a better place. So bring them food when you're gonna do an in-service for them. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what the EVS services did for us before COVID, during COVID, and then, of course, now post-COVID. This environmental service cleaning was, is, has always been very important, not just because of the um, public health emergency, but every day in the things that they do. So I'm going to talk about some of the EVS cleaning. We've got to keep the standards high. It doesn't matter if you're a AAA HC or DNV or Joint Commission, or even if you're just sort of one place I work for, they just had a state certification and they were very, very high standards. And then when they come in, they want to say, they say, who trains your staff? And they say, infection control does. And that way we can show that, that we have high standards in keeping our facility clean. So some of the challenges that I have, of course, during COVID, we all can remember when we could not get any supplies. I mean, we we were running out and then our shipments weren't coming in. We, we didn't have the right brands. We were having to get a different kind of brand. Well, maybe they didn't know how to use that um, particular brand that we had to get in because our regular one we didn't have. So it, that was a big challenge with our environmental services folks, making for sure that they knew how to use the chemicals and clean, clean the facility properly. And we had a lot of burnout because they had to work a lot of long hours, just like everyone else, the IP, um, the nurses staff. I had to keep them on call because I needed them to come in and do a terminal clean on, on a room because that room's got to be used. We've got that room already booked for someone else. So I know that they have a lot of employee burnout and that's why I really like to um, make for sure that my EVS workers are trained and, and, and enjoy what they do too. Um, pathogen exposure, whenever we first got um, the COVID vaccine or any vaccines, anytime, flu shots, I tell you, my EVS workers are the first in line. They love to come in. They're like, Debbie's going to give me my shots. And sometimes they won't let anyone else give it to them because they know that um, if them getting their vaccines is going to be very important with them working in our facility to keep their, their self safe so they don't catch things um, even at work. And then um, I already kind of talked about the terminal cleaning um, challenges to get rooms turned around real fast, or maybe you had a patient that came into the clinic that um, 
you know, had COVID. Well, what are you going to do to get that room turned around? So at first we had the fogging machines and the EVS were going in there and using the fogging machines. And that was at a facility I was at a couple years ago. But I love Oklahoma City Ending Clinic has four UV robots and they are the top of the line. And um, not all of my staff are allowed um, to use them, but I'm going to get everyone trained. Um, some things that you might want to consider is um, making for sure that all the products that you use are um, environmentally safe to use. And one of the things is, are they mixing the products and are they mixing them properly? Are they diluting them too much? I like it when we have a facility that has uh, the automatic dispenser, that it comes out diluted at the right amount. And then my EBS workers don't have to worry about that. Oh, PPE. They've got to know their PPE, how to don, how to doff, when to use, following all of OSHA standards. And then, of course, I like to train them myself. I even talked to their boss today about some other training on some things. Um, do they have hand hygiene competencies? Um, do they understand bloodborne pathogens like Karen was talking about, knowing what diseases that you can be exposed to? Laundry and linen, I like to go to our laundry company. I do an on-site visit to make for sure that our linen is um, sanitized and disinfected properly. And then uh, always make for sure that your EBS um, staff know how to handle biohazards, um, even cleaning up vomit, cleaning up different um, body fluids. It's important for them to know. Okay, so cleaning and disinfecting, once again, they are, they are my key players. Um, I do have their, their manager, um, the facilities manager. He is on my infection control team. And um, not, I, can, I go to him for things, but I also like to just talk actually to um, the staff themselves. And I want them to know how valuable that they are to us. And I always want um, to honor them for those things that they do. So, as you know, it takes a team to te keep it clean, and uh, I, I'm glad that I have a good environmental services clean team. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie, for your great presentation. Um, we just like to quickly um, open the floor for any follow-up um, Q&A for Debbie here. So feel free to post something in the chat or unmute yourself um, if you have a question for Debbie. Um, and it looks like we have a question here. Um, do you make your own trainings for EVS, Debbie? Well, some of the times I do, because it just depends what I want to talk about. But I use the APIC. APIC has those all those videos, and they're in Spanish. But right now, I don't have very many um, uh, foreign-speaking um, EVS, but AP has the um, videos that I and they like to sh I like to show them those. They're in English and Spanish. Thanks, Debbie. Um, and we also had another question about whether the slides are available, and they will be included in the follow-up email, which um, Zoe just posted in the chat. Um, we have a, another question for you, Debbie. Um, you talked about high standards. How do those standards align with what is expected from OKCIC to maintain your AAAHC accreditation? Well, AAAHC, I follow the CDC. So follow your CDC guidelines, which, you know, if you We've got, we all know those. And then also, I'm always referring back to um, APIC because that's the standard. But um, AAAHC, I wasn't there when we had our visit in March, um, February or March this year. I've only been there a few months now, but um, I'm going to follow CDC guidelines. Great. Thanks, Debbie. And I think we have... Time just for one last question. Um, Nicole posted, do you, you have examples of topics that you share with EVS staff that aren't in APIC? Yes, so um, the next meeting I've already decided I'm gonna talk about contact time, kill time. They just love learning different things like that. So um, I always um, have an agenda of, sometimes we just talk about PPE. Sometimes we talk about, you know, gloves. Sometimes we talk about chemicals. Um, sometimes we'll, uh, the, the next one I do want to talk about kill time 
So I always have an agenda of different things I want to teach them about. Well, great. Thanks again um, for your time and for your presentation, yeah. Debbie. And moving on, um, if you're interested in presenting during our UIO Spotlight, um, please follow the link to the forum in the chat. And so now we will open the floor for any final questions or comments for either Karen or Debbie, and please feel free to share by unmuting yourself or typing in the chat. All right, I have another question for Debbie while we're waiting. So Debbie, in addition to the meetings do you have twice a year, how often do you have additional trainings with the EVS staff? Um, not that often, but I am always there. If I see them cleaning a room, I stop at the door and I say, I'm just watching you. And they're like, okay. So they know that I'm watching them. So then um, just the twice a year, do I do their competencies um, with them? But all the time. If I see them on the unit, I'm going to stop. I'm going to watch them and I will fill out a form that I saw them clean from, you know, high to low. And I saw them change their mop head. I saw them change their gloves. So I have a form that I also check them on. And then that gives me a chance right then to, that, to talk with them and give them any um, opportunities for improvement, something that they could improve on. So I watched them also clean the rooms. Great. Thanks, Debbie. Um, and we have another question from Lisa. Um, I think this is open to either you or Karen. Um, what are your recommendations for healthcare laundry in a fully outpatient clinic? Um, and she says that they do their own laundry, which is mainly dental scrubs. I would say make for sure that you're having your water temperatures, uh, everything posted, I um, mean, and logged water temperatures, um, um, your chemicals, just making for sure that you're following the guidelines. If you're doing the your laundry yourself for the scrubs, still have to have your logs. Well, that was a perfect answer, Debbie. I would also add that the person who's handling the laundry be very careful with their own self-protection in terms of any spills or um, contamination there. Um, definitely something to also consider in that handling. Um, I see a question in the chat box regarding negative pressure rooms. Um, for Lisa, and thank you for uh, sharing that. That was something very commonly encountered um, for us. And so um, it, it's also then about the air time that you open the windows for that room. Hopefully if there are windows available, um, even after um, doing the, the terminal clean to make sure that anything that might have been aerosolized has filtered down. And um, we've certainly had that come up with uh, varicella exposures um, in our urgent care setting. So um, working within the limitations of the facility that you have um, and working closely with your infection control um, expert on that. Would you add anything else, um, Debbie or, or Crystal, who's in the audience? All right. Thank you, Karen and Debbie. Um, we have one last question before we have to move on. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, from Julie, did you help her purchase the UV light robots and did you find that stood out better than the others? And Julie says that she would like more info if anyone has done um, investigation and purchased these. I know we got ours with the COVID money. Uh, we have four of them. We have three buildings. So we're building a new hospital and that one will go with us to the new hospital that we have. So I, it came from COVID money and they're very expensive, but they will do a terminal clean and 
kill the bacteria, viruses. No one wants to be in that room until the robot's gone through there. We had a contest where everyone even got to name their their robot. And so they have some really unusual names. <laughs> this is Crystal Byer. Um, so there are different types of UV machines by different companies. You have Trudy, you have PDI. If you just reach out to those vendors, uh, they can help provide information on their different machines. I know at APIC conference, PDI did introduce a new machine. It's a lot smaller. Trudy is very massive, um, or at least the original one was, and now it's evolved into a smaller machine. So just reach out to those particular vendors uh, to get, you know, certain quotes, because as Debbie said, stated, they are very expensive. Um, but you have foundations that can help, you know, don't forget about your resources. Think, look at those foundations that are willing uh, to help uh, purchase uh, the, the things that we need in our healthcare areas. Great, thank you so much, Crystal, and Karen and Debbie for your presentations. Um, before we close today's event, we'd like to remind you that NICUI has an IPC Assistance Center that you can join to access and share resources, interact with other UIOs, and more. You can also visit our website, email our team, and listen to our podcast. We just had a new episode released that features a wonderful conversation with young Native professionals in the health space, and including the NICUI IPC fellows and youth council members, including yours truly. Um, and you can also download and print our IPC infographic to hang at your UIO and watch our video reminding healthcare warriors about hand cleaning protocols. This is our last scheduled community of learning for now, but Nikui has also has additional events coming up, such as those you see here. Finally, scan the QR code on the screen to use the link that is shared in the chat. After submitting your Nikui survey, you will also have the opportunity to enter a raffle to win a prize from Nikui. All of this information will also be shared via email with you. Thank you all for attending today's event and have a wonderful rest of your day.